of the Connecticut Academy of Arts and Sciences and friends. I am not in any shape or form a historian. Uh, however, these are just some reflections about an important topic, uh, I think, uh, particularly as Dr. Tigor said, for, for our time. Um, the often untold story of African Americans and nonviolence, the journey of an idea. So I want to begin with where I will end. And, and the question is, what can the African American nonviolent movements teach us today about how to personally and as a society cope with and transform the violence and brutishness of today to embody a nonviolent way of life. This is a picture familiar to all of us. I have it here because in 1966, Dr. King came to campaign for better housing conditions in Chicago. Some of you might recall that he commented that some of the worst violence and brutality towards him was expressed by people who didn't like his coming to on the southwest side of Chicago. Before that campaign, before they, the committee took to the streets and went to uh, that area of Chicago, he came to my church. I was 16 and I sat there and listened to this magnificent person and voice as he talked about his dream of a better society and nonviolence. But I started thinking, how did he get there? How did he come to the sense of calling that he had? And so I'm going to do a very general survey of some of the, the journey that took him to the place that he was in 66 and then of course later in 68 when he was assassinated. What a lot of people don't know is that African Americans were interested in traveling to India in the early 1920s all the way up to the early 1930s. For an example, Juliet uh, Daracott was the National Secretary of the YWCA was one of two African Americans in an American student Christian movement delegation to visit India. She left the YWCA to become Dean of Women at Fisk University in Nashville. African Americans became increasingly aware of Gandhi in the years during and after World War I and after Gandhi's return to India from South Africa in 1915. The search by African Americans was on for a black Gandhi in the USA because they strongly identified with Gandhi's method of nonviolent protest. George Washington Carver met Charles Andrews, who was a Methodist uh, bishop, uh, pastor, who knew Gandhi. And uh, Andrews came to Tuskegee in 1929 and did a lecture on Gandhi. He struck up a deep conversation and relationship with George Washington Carver. Carver sent pamphlets to Gandhi regarding agricultures for farmers to use in their work in India. And they started a long correspondence, that is George Washington Carver and Gandhi. In 1930, Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, urged students to protest segregation using an understanding of Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence. And actually two students did so in Washington, DC. Mordecai Johnson had also met and visited Gandhi in India. In 1935, Madeline Slade, some of you might recognize her name, Maribam, who was a part of Gandhi's uh, community, and was invited by Howard Thurman to give lectures at Howard University. 
thus beginning a relationship between uh, Thurman and Gandhi that initially started with correspondence and later on an actual trip to India, which I'll mention in a, in a moment. In 1936, a year later, Benjamin Mays also meets with Gandhi in India. So Benjamin Mays visits India and Gandhi in 1936. A friendship delegation to India was led by Howard Thurman and his wife Sue Bailey Thurman and with another couple, Edward Carroll and Fanola Carroll. Edward Carroll would become one of the first bishops of the United Methodist Church, and he was a graduate of Yale Divinity School. This is a picture of Howard Thurman, passed away in 1981. I had the pleasure of meeting him and beginning a very short what lived relationship with him in 1979. It transformed and continues to guide my life, his work and his writings, and my memories of our conversations. Here is the book that chronicles the Carols and the Thurmans' visit to India called Visions of a Better World. It's a fascinating account, very detailed and worth the reading. Of course, we have this standard picture of Mahatma Gandhi. I want you to make to keep make a note just on the side that the year of Gandhi's death was 1948. But uh, in the 1920s, it was the black press that that constantly covered and wrote stories about the movement Gandhi was leading in India. Uh, yeah, the Chicago Defender was one of those newspapers and called Gandhi the greatest man in the world today. W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey were rivals. Du Bois uh, focusing on integration and militant, that is, transforming society from within. Marcus Garvey uh, had a more pan-Africanist, separatist view, although they were ideologically um, challenging each other. Both of them loved Gandhi. So Du Bois convinced Gandhi to write a special appeal to black people in the NAACP crisis magazine. And, and Gandhi did, and it's entitled To the American Negro. Now let me just say parenthetically um, that there is research and, de and discussion about some of the prejudicial views, some even call Gandhi racist, because of some of the things he said and, and how he responded to black South Africans when he was in South Africa. Um, so people are complex, they grow, they learn, as we all do. But the early career of Gandhi as a lawyer in South Africa uh, has some unfortunate um, indications of his seeing himself above black South Africans. But well, we know that uh, the Leo, Leo Tolstoy, The Kingdom of God is Within, and Henry David Thoreau's On Civil Disobedience were the really important texts that shaped and influenced Gandhi's thinking and life. On the visit to uh, India that Thurman led, the last day of their meeting with Gandhi and his ashram, uh, Thurman writes that just as they were leaving, almost as a doorknob statement, Gandhi says, it may be through the Negro that the undulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. Now, I want you to make a note of the year, roughly 1935-36, when Gandhi said this. Dr. King was born in 1929, so he was around six or seven years old when Gandhi made this statement. However, prior to Gandhi's statement, Franklin Frazier, an African-American sociologist in the 1920s, not 1935 as Gandhi commented, in the magazine The Crisis said, there should arise a Gandhi to lead Negroes without hate in their hearts to stop 
tilling the fields of the South under the peonage system to cease paying taxes to the state that keeps their children in ignorance and to ignore the ubiqu ubiquitous disenfranchisement in Jim Crow laws. So in the 1920s, Andrews and Du Bois, as I indicated, started a correspondence. Gandhi wrote his letter to the Negro, published in the Crisis in magazine in 1929. So when I saw King in 1966, and maybe some of you have memories of seeing him as well, what I was witnessing was how a person um, had been influenced and shaped by uh, these these folks who in turn shared their vision of nonviolence because of of Gandhi's influence. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that it's all about Gandhi and King being a kind of clone because that's not the case. The fundamental um, intriguing question for me is how it how it is that an idea can become flesh. In the Christian world, we talk about in the word became flesh in the person and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was, it's, it's a mystery, but yet something to really behold that while all these people in Dr. King's life shared with them how they were impacted by Gandhi's notion of nonviolence, it took up resonance in Dr. King and became embodied, that nonviolent word became flesh for the American situation and then to the world. And it's a fascinating thing to think about. So Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., of course, the father of Martin Luther King Jr., you may not know that in the early 1930s, Dr. King Sr. went to Germany uh, to be a part of some celebration of Martin Luther's uh, posting of the 95 Theses and the break away from the Catholic Church, thus starting uh, the Methodist Church. And Dr. King Sr. was so impressed with the life of Martin Luther that he came back and legally changed his name to Martin Luther King. His name, his birth name was Michael. And Dr. King's Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was to be Michael Luther King Jr. Dr. Benjamin Mays, the president of Morehouse College, as I indicated, um, uh, went to India and was teaching at Morehouse when Dr. King was a student. Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, also met with Gandhi and in 1950 gave a lecture on Gandhi in Philadelphia at which Dr. King was in, in the audience. And the lecture was so, so gripping and compelling that this is one of the early, early moments when Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. started his, his entry into this idea of nonviolence and how it became for him flesh. Um, so Mordecai Johnson gives this lecture in 1950. Howard Thurman, who also went to India, as I said, in 1935-36, was teaching at, at, uh, at Morehouse, and King heard lectures about uh, Gandhi through him, and of course through his, his wife, Coretta Scott King, and Dr. James Lawson, who is still with us. I had the honor of working with him two summers ago at the Children's Defense Fund Proctor Summer Institute. Uh, James Lawson was the tactician and, and, and he, he deeply committed to nonviolence and taught uh, people how to resist nonviolently. He was the one who trained the students who sat in the lunch counters in Nashville in Tennessee. Uh, and he was one of the persons that tutored Dr. King about nonviolence, as well as Baynard Rustin, who is often an unsung hero. Some of you know that Baynard was the genius behind the March on Washington in 1963. He had also studied nonviolence through the uh, uh, FOR, 
Fellowship of Reconciliation and tutored as well Dr. King. In fact, there's this famous moment when Dr. King's family was being threatened and houses being bombed and Dr. King uh, reportedly got a, a gun, a rifle to keep in the house. And Bernard said he couldn't do that because his commitment to nonviolence had to be total. And Dr. King got rid of the gun. Here's Lawson, Bernard, Mordecai Johnson, Howard Thurman, Coretta King, Dr. King Sr. One of my blessed memories of Coretta King is I had a chance to have lunch with her when I was inducted into the Morehouse College of Preachers. Um, and we had a wonderful, we sat next to each other at, a, at this dinner table. And then a few years later, when she came to Connecticut to the graduation of her, her niece, stopping over in Bridgeport, I had my daughter, Carolyn, with me and greeted her. And she invited my daughter up to her room. And she and my daughter had, had a, I guess, a, a lady, lady, girl, girl conversation. It's a blessed memory for all of us. Of course, Benjamin Mays. So here's the, here's the overall thrust. African Americans have historically had a global or world view, the India, Africa, uh, and the Caribbean. African Americans drew inspiration for their struggle in the USA from the freedom movements of other people of color from around the world. African Americans demonstrated nonviolent civil disobedience uh, in the US long before the modern civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s that we, many, we all know about. The genius of Dr. King and the beloved community he helped to further create lies in how he and other members of the movement made the words of nonviolence and civil disobedience flesh and blood for the greater good of America and the world. Nonviolence is an ideology, a worldview, a set of values and ethics and a tactic that was taught to small groups of black people and later groups of black and white people throughout the South, at least from as early if not before the 1930s and onward. Some of the implications of this is that African-American nonviolent movements and civil disobedience demonstrates, demonstrated the power of one having a clarity of purpose, a sense of community, particularly in situations of life and death. The power of community and music and, and, and ideology to restore strength and cope effectively with the trauma of the violence members of the community endure and the deaths that they had to mourn. They transformed trauma into the triumph of soul force, which is a very important concept in nonviolent uh, tactics and philosophy. Uh, and by the way, when, when George Washington Carver created his pamphlets about agriculture that Gandhi used to help his own community uh, better grow food and whatnot, he, he did it in a framework of soul force. He, he talked about agriculture, agriculture and how to grow things as a part of a larger soul force of the universe. Of the universe. <laughs> George Washington Carver. So how, as an idea, did nonviolence become a real human way of being in life? It enabled and empowered its ambassadors to face with dignity, evil, suffering, and death. Some of you may recall Victor Hugo's statement, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. The idea of nonviolence starting in the early 1900s was used, was lived out by black and white people, but particularly black people, uh, by the mentors that, that mentored Dr. King. And again, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's partly a, partly a mystery, but something to think about. What were the forces that had to come together in order for nonviolence to take up the kind of resonance it did in the person of Dr. King? Uh, 
and and to meet the the moment uh, that has that has changed the world. As some of you may know, in 1959, uh, Dr. King was stabbed while autographing a book in Chicago, and then he went into hospital convalescence. Um, Howard Thurman writes that he 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 had Martin on his mind so much that he went and visited him in a hospital. And part of the conversation uh, was that Thurman urged King to recuperate by going to India. Uh, and Dr. Thurman uh, talks about the fact that he needed that distance, that time, that spiritual nurturing. So he and Coretta, and I think a couple other people went to India shortly after he got out of the hospital in 1959. But I ask you to make note of what year did Gandhi pass? Can any, anybody recall? Nineteen forty-eight. King went to India in nineteen fifty-nine. Doctor King never met Gandhi. He never physically met Gandhi. <laughs> never had a conversation with him. But through all of these different mentors and the and the, the legwork that others were uh, engaged in the non, in nonviolence through all these mentors, um, the, the message and the tactic of nonviolence uh, took up its resonance in Dr. King as well as others. But uh, obviously, but how it is that Dr. King became, if you will, the ambassador, the representative, along with a cloud of witnesses and black men and women, boys and girls, who lived out the same nonviolent philosophy. How, is, how it is that he, he emerged as the catalyst and the focal point of not only change, but also the focal point of evil, so much so that his life was his life was taken. Um, so we're, we're, we're wrestling with the question. I told you the question that, um, that we end with is the question we began with. What can the African-American nonviolent movements teach us today about how to personally and as a society cope with and transform the violence and brutishness of today to embody a nonviolent way of life? So that uh, so much is said about Dr. King as it should be said and those who were part of the movement in the 50s and 60s, but there were so many more people who laid the foundation from the early 1900s, and indeed from 1619, since the first recorded presence of enslaved people from Africa, uh, laid the foundation that builds up, that builds up to the, what we now call the modern day civil rights movement. Um, for an example, 15 years, 15 years before Rosa Parks refused to, to give up her seat, Pauli Murray, uh, the African-American lawyer and, and uh, Episcopal priest, uh, refused to give up her seat on a bus in the South 15 years earlier and was arrested. Um, but again, it, wasn't, it didn't become the catalyst. So it's a it's a question to ponder. It's the historians uh, amongst us who can help us to think about, as we look back on history, what what constitutes forces that come together in such a way that can lead to such massive change. What forces might we um, try to identify and encourage to come to the fore now to help us to transform uh, our culture into a, a more nonviolent and less brutish uh, society. And uh, there's no one answer. It won't come from only one place. Uh, but it's, Mac, it, it's just fascinating for me to think that how the African Americans who paid attention and went to India in the 1920s and 30s kept talking about the emergence of a Gandhi for America. And 
Gandhi himself say the message of nonviolence to the world just perhaps will come through, quote unquote, the Negro. Um, so if I be so bold to say, uh, can the message of nonviolence come through us? And with that, I thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was just thinking about that last question um, as we think about all these different movements. Um, you, you think about Black Lives Matter, you think about all of these activists in the world as we know it has, has been changing. Um, and that's, that's a, a wonderful question as we think about what the future might look like. I'm gonna open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Um, you can unmute yourself and directly ask um, Dr. Streets questions you have. Or you can also put them in the chat and I'll read them out loud. I'm, I'm glad to see my daughter here who is a middle school teacher in New Haven, 25 years. I don't wanna put you on the spot, Carolyn, but would you like to just share briefly what it was like for you to sit with Mrs. King in the hotel? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi everyone. Um, so when I was in high school at the time and uh, when I got the, the go ahead to meet with um, Mrs. King, I remember distinctly we went up to, I forget what floor she was on, but I met her, first I met her niece, I believe. Um, she was of some relation to her and um, brought me to um, Mrs. King's room. And I mean, I just cried like a baby. And I didn't expect it, you know, I didn't expect that to happen, but I was just so overwhelmed with just standing in the room with her that I couldn't keep it together. And uh, she was very gracious, you know, understood, you know, this high school freshman, you know, young girl. And, you know, I remember her asking me, you know, what, where I went to school and studies, you know, general questions. She was very gracious and very kind. And when I finally was able to get myself together, you know, I think I was able to construct some kind of sentences, <laughs> at least at minimum tell her my name. But I just remember her being so kind and so nice and so gracious. And just her, her spirit was overwhelmingly um, indescribable. Um, just standing in the room, again, standing in the room with her and, and this woman who had so much on her agenda, giving me the time to um, just sit with me for a moment was, is something that I'll never forget. Thank you. Someone put in the chat, uh, appreciate the correction. Uh, I may have mispronounced or wrote uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Rustin's first name. Uh, it's Bayard, not Baynard. Thank you for that correction. Other thoughts, comments, questions? So I, I have a question um, within the context of Black Lives Matter. Um, Dad, Jerry, <laughs> you, you talk about nonviolence and um, I, I'm wondering how that message is resonating with today's movement because at, at some of and so you know I went to some of the rallies and um, many were not of that feeling of turning the other cheek they it was more so an eye for an eye with some um, so I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that well this is this is in a way is not a new problem because some of us know that there was tension in in the civil rights movement about violence versus nonviolence the whole debate between Stokely Carmichael SNCC and and Dr King uh, some had the posture that if 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 pounced upon you retaliate you don't you don't initiate the violence but you 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 can respond with violence as a form of self protection i think the 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 integrity and the strength of the nonviolent movement as, as interpreted uh, by Dr. King and others around him 
rested on help people having a really deep commitment and really understanding the soul force, the power of nonviolence. And so I think if if there if there's a way for people, your generation and younger people in Black Lives Matter movement to um, to explore, and not, I'm not saying they have it. I, I'm not on I'm not on the inside that, so I don't know. But there's there should hopefully be some serious serious study about the power of nonviolence and how it can lead to change. Uh, uh, so that's what happened with with uh, 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 Bayard Rustin and and Jim Lawson, uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, other groups. Highlander Institute that did a lot of training in the summer, um, the the campaigns during the, the voting rights campaign in the South in the in the early 60s, a lot of New Haven students, Yale students went down. They were trained, and you um, uh, and that that's what it takes. It takes it takes that kind of commitment, that kind of surrender, that kind of trust in the philosophy uh, to make it to make it real, and um just as it just as nonviolence as a way of life and as a philosophy has to be made real think about other values in our lives that if we really don't embrace them and try to and try to actually have our whole being to reflect where will we be uh, other values like love respect for one another do unto others as you would want others to do unto you uh, that that your neighbor is your fellow human being, whether they live next door or around the globe. These are not just sentiments and nice rosy language. It has to be behavioral. It has to be operated on. That is, it has to be actually practiced. And that means just like hate, I believe, is not something that people are born to do. You learn to hate. You have to learn to love. And you have to learn how to protect uh, yourself as a loving person in the sense of being able to live that out. Uh, and sometimes that unfortunately comes with some significant consequences, such as one's own danger to one's own life. And uh, But that's how deep the commitment is for some people. Jerry? Yes. I was trained as a viral epidemiologist. Today, because of the pandemic and gene sequencing, we are now on the doorstep of genomic epidemiologists. So now we have an opportunity to look at people's genetic makeup from birth all through life through simple blood tests that used to be just a means of uh, looking at metabolic changes. Now we can look at genetic changes. Are we on the doorstep of defining what in the human genome? You, you have to unmute yourself. You Okay. Am I unmuted? Uh, yeah, you're unmuted. What in the human genome, what? Is associated with violent behavior. Well, it's an interesting question, both philosophically and certainly as you lay it out scientifically. If you, if you believe that hate and, and, and hateful behavior is learned and not genetic, uh, then that's, that, that leads you in one direction. Um, if there's some de de genetic predispositions uh, that may cause someone to act in a violent way, uh, th th that's worth exploring too. But I don't want to be so reductionistic uh, 
to say that violent behavior is is due to some kind of genetic uh, mutation in a, in a person, because I don't want to minimize the power and the strength of social conditioning, no matter what environment one what, no matter what one brings genetically to an environment, the environment has an impact on that development. I asked Lawson, uh, Dr. Lawson, one day. I asked him, "How did they? How how did he and some others keep their sanity?" And uh, when looking at so much death and and being close to death themselves, and he said something very interesting, at least to me. He said it was not it was not it was their sense of community that they weren't alone; they were with each other. But he said it was music. They sang together. They sang a lot. And the power of music to help regulate the nervous system and to reroute the way you're thinking uh, was one of the one of the ways that they gained strength. And he said, of course, not everybody uh, survived it as well. In fact, he said one of the unknown untold stories about that generation of warriors who would now be in their late uh, at, at best. Uh, late 70s, not at best, 70s and 80s and maybe 90s, is that that whole generation has lived with trauma. And some of that trauma has manifested itself in their families. But we would never know about it because it's lived in privacy, so to speak. You know, So not everybody got through that era unscathed. But he said those who, who did, uh, uh, he pointed to the sense of community and, and music. The second thing in response, Dr. Tigor, to your question, I asked, I asked um, Otis Moss uh, Jr., uh, who was a close young, young person, worked with Dr. King. In fact, Dr. King performed the wedding for he and his wife. Were, were there ever any moments, could you tell me about any moments about uh, their struggle with nonviolence? He said, oh yeah, there was one SCL meeting where it was hot and heavy about whether or not the, they should adopt any kind of violent posture. And he said, Dr. King was very, very patient. He quietly listened for two hours to this debate. And then he said he stood up in the middle of the room and said something to, to the following. If he was if he was the last person on earth that will practice nonviolence, he would he will be, because it would take away the excuse that it was not humanly possible. Think about that. He said, if I become the exemplar, it takes the excuse. If someone wants to say, oh, that's not humanly possible. You had to be some kind of special person or you know some super saint or whatnot. In a way, he was responding to your question about genetics, that uh, whatever one's predisposition is, one can learn to be different in the world than what they're predisposed to be. If you have a way of understanding that, uh, your genetic predisposition. I'm not talking about pathological uh, problems with someone born with a, a cycle, uh, with, a, with organic deficits that might make them pathological or in some way. A normal person uh, still has to be grown <laughs> in a social environment, and that social environment has to lead, help that person understand what it means to live nonviolently. So that's my short answer to your very important, deep question, Dr. Tigor. <laughs> we we could go on on this topic for hours because it has uh, perplexed scientists forever. This is a fundamental question. But your presentation today uh, brings us some hope that somehow we're going to survive these enormous threats to our sense of humanity. 
And but the challenge, I, 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 I like and I agree with your optimism. I, I, I'm hopeful because I'm a person of faith. Uh, but I also know unless unless there is constant messaging and people who are willing to be ambassadors for the message of nonviolence, uh, uh, our chances of, of pushing us towards our, our greater maturity as a society and a nation become become less. Uh, what we saw on January. Excuse me, Dad, your audio went out for a moment. Uh, um, am I here? You, we can hear you now, but it, okay. it went out mid sentence. Okay. Uh, we, we need ambassadors for it. And, and we saw what happened. We saw in the last two, two weeks violence against uh, people. We saw in January the violence at the, at the Capitol. One could explain the violence, individual violence of the shooters, and maybe use a, a um, mental health argument. But what we saw in the Capitol was a social phenomenon. It was a community of people who had embraced an ideology, the means to, of which to express they chose to be violent. That's a choice. That's not genetics, at least in my opinion, in general. And that's that's what we have to keep keep our vigilance about, the, the keeping and a message of nonviolence, the importance of it. You can do it from a religious perspective if one is so inclined. You can do it from a philosophical perspective, a humanist perspective. You can do it from a, from a simple but not reductionistic self-interest argument that is in our best interest not to kill one another. <laughs> our, our survival as a species uh, depends on our ability to survive, and not to, you know, and it, it, it's and it and it flows over to the environment. It's not just that we're not to kill each other. We got to stop killing animals, and plants, and and you know we can go. You know, some people may say this is liberal and all that. Okay, you can call it what you want, but Martin Sing, Martin King said it the best. Either we all learn together to live as brothers and sisters, or we die together as fools. Uh, and so, I think history will show a, even a deeper and greater appreciation for the person of King, for him to have who have, to have been ca caught, if you will, and he surrendered himself to that notion, as did Gandhi in his time. It, it's uh, as as fabulous as that is. What I think what Dr. King would want us to believe and know is that we too can be the same kind of ambassadors in our local situations. We're not all called to to to, to a platform that might lead us to a Nobel Prize, but that's not the issue. That's not the goal. You see. And it's a message for the whole for the whole world with the conflicts we have in other places around the world. It's it's the forgive I me. Mean, it's 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 the way by which we have dehum we can dehumanize one another, uh, and and and, it, and racism takes on so many different forms. It's not racism is not just color prejudice. Uh, racism is religious prejudice, sexual orientation prejudice gender prejudice. Uh, it takes the form of, 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 of misogyny. It, I mean, there's so many ways by which people are dehumanized and humiliated and identified as people worthy of death or invisibility. That's, a, that's part of the long continuum, not to minimize black racism, but we've got a racism problem that's even deeper than black racism. <laughs> Gary, you, I'll take up the offering now if anybody wants to. <laughs> Gary, you have, you have brought out the best of Greg, do we have any more time? Sorry, do we have any more time? We had two questions. I don't know if we want to. I'm here. I'm here. I'm, and I've, some of the members from Dixwell Church are here, too. Thank thank you all for being here. And um, my, my scholar colleague, Dr. Hoffler. <laughs> Greg, do we have time for two more questions? 
Dr. Shreves is here and I'm here and we're all here. Um, Armin, you had a question and then I think we also had a question from David. So uh, as long as you are still here for the next few minutes, we'll answer those questions and then we'll come to a close. Okay. Anyway. Yes. Thank you very much for, for the talk. It was very enlightening tracing all those uh, connections. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about another connection and that is to the uh, centers around the concept that was important to King about the beloved community uh, and the fact that uh, one of his uh, mentors, Howard Thurman, was uh, influenced by the American philosopher Josiah Royce, who had uh, coined that term and that concept of this aspirational notion of the Mm -hmm. of the beloved community. Um, do, you, do, you, do you see any um, um, in your studies of these connections, any, any uh, d sort of tension between um, that idea and, uh, and the idea of, of um, nonviolence non is, is, you could say is a, is a means um, and the aspirational idea of the beloved community is is the goal in King. Um, right. Did he ever talk explicitly about um, you know his his roots in in that kind of uh, American philosophical tradition? Um, oh yeah, I mean uh, it, there's a a lot of studies in, about King and his dissertation and some of his teachers, uh, and of course Thurman was also deeply influenced by Rufus Jones, the, mis the mystical side of Thurman's work. Uh, I, I think I would, I would want to talk about a beloved society. Uh, uh, community is, is also so fine too, but some people when they hear beloved community, they think about it in sectional ways. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I, if we can keep pushing the idea of a, of a beloved society, the political response to such a notion uh, would be that's communism, <laughs> that's socialism. You see, the politics of it, the, the political response. People, people are threat. Some people are threatened. We just really talk about a beloved society, where you really do strive for uh, uh, equality and justice. Not that it'll be ever perfect, but if you're intentional about it and have ways of measuring how far we are close to the goals to hold everybody accountable. Uh, that's a different way of being. The 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 legislature in Georgia's recent uh, vote about voter suppression is not only is 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 a, an affront to democracy. Period. But it's uh, but it's and it doesn't it doesn't support a beloved society or a beloved community as a society as well. And to the extent that people can can see those actions as a partisan politics, to, it is in a narrow sense of the word, without seeing their longer overshadowing impact on the society as a whole, uh, a, a blind you know that's a blind spot that can come up to bite us all uh, in the future. And regardless of what your politics may be, I am so glad that President Biden chose to say that that action by the Georgia legislature was a return to Jim Crow. He named it and, you know, he's get a lot of pushback about it, but part of be creating a beloved society is not mincing words and labeling things for what they are. Evil is evil or, or it's not, <laughs> you know, and, and moving in that direction. So, hey, And then David, you're our last question. If anyone has other questions, put them in the chat and we can um, get those to Dr. Sheets after this. Um, but okay. go ahead. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, uh, Reverend Streets, uh, for, the, for your uh, important uh, talk and also to your daughter for that uh, you know, moving recollection. Uh, I, I just had three quick thoughts. One was that I, I felt like this uh, your talk was so important 
because of the you know extent to which the society seems to have become so polarized. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't, I don't mean to be hyperbolic, but there are times I feel like uh, there are certain forces that in our society that are really becoming an existential threat for a uh, broad spectrum of the American population. And uh, I just had a kind of historical reflection was that um, about someone I'm not sure you mentioned, but there was an activist I came into contact with in 1971 named Hosea Williams. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he and he was uh, nonviolent. He was part of the NAACP. Worked with mm -hmm. uh, John Lewis and uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and he had been. Uh, According to the story, he had been, um, you know, savagely beaten uh, when he came back from World War II, and somehow this transformed him and into a nonviolent activist, which is kind of an astonishing uh, story. Uh, and, but, and, but when I when I met him, he was uh, providing some leadership, and uh, it was an anti-war demonstration in Washington in 1971, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, he was uh, uh, leading a sit-in, you know. Was but but uh, and that was. Uh, I thought that was important to have also African American leadership in the uh, so-called peace movement at the time, anti-war movement at the time. That was also coming from Dr. King. Now this this would have been after Dr. King had been assassinated, but mm -hmm. in '71. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's another story. I didn't mean to go down that road, no. but you know. The, uh, the, the, those, those April, May protests in Washington in 1971 are interesting to compare to the uh, insurrection on January 6th, because in, in, in May 1971, the federal government called up uh, 10,000 uh, troops, National Guard, mm -hmm. federal troops, Marines, 5,000 uh, police. I mean, the response was remarkably different at the, at the time. But uh, the other thing that I was, I, I, that was my concluding thought was that for that uh, action in Washington, D.C., we had training uh, right on the scene, like the night before you had to go to a training and have a, you joined an affinity group and you went through training together to engage and react nonviolently, whatever would come. And I thought that was extremely, you reminded me of that. I thought it was extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, uh, with some, I don't know if that's going to be, what, what did Biden call it today, the politics of the possible. I don't know if that'll be possible, but with some of the, some of the changes in uh, education, with uh, changes in Connecticut law to require education in Holocaust and genocide studies and in African American history. I wonder if there could be a kind of, uh, you know, training in, in nonviolent civil disobedience, mm -hmm. the, the virtues of this kind of political action mm -hmm. at, a, at a time when people are, are, are so um, polarized. But yeah. I, I just thought it was a fantastic uh, uh, talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Hosea. Uh, it's, there are so many people like, like a Pauli Mary who was not often associated with the modern civil rights movement, but yet she was an architect of, of the Brown v. Board of Education, uh, as well as, as I said, she refused to get up her seat 15 years before uh, Rosa Parks. And so there's so many, uh, so many incidences of men and women, clergy, uh, even Dr. King Sr. Uh, led protests early in Martin Jr.'s life, who he observed this, and so all these things he was absorbing, and it's just fascinating to me how it how it manifested in the way that it did, in his being becoming, a, if you will, becoming a catalyst. The last thing I would say, you you said, David, to remind me, one of the things that that um, Dr. King struggled with, according to Thurman, was how could he convince people to be nonviolent. And part of the discussion Thurman had with him in the hospital, and, and I'm sure before, and was in Thurman's book um, uh, and other writings, he talks about yielding the nerve center of your being. It's a combination of spirituality and biology. 
Hmm. He said, because the oppressed learn, they learn how to behave to protect themselves from violence. And so if you, in, in the segregated South and North too, back in the 30s and 40s, if a black person was walking down the street and a white person was coming in the same direction, the black person would automatically step off into the street to let the white person pass. He said, that's a bio lot, that, that's something you learn to do. You condition your body to respond in a way that would make it less threatening to someone who could take your life or cause your life to be taken. And he said, if you can get people, convince people that the value of surrendering yourself to a philosophy of nonviolence, it will re-regulate your nervous system. It becomes embodied in behavior. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of giving you a, a generalist uh, uh, summary of that. But that really clicked for, for King. Yeah. And he had to do it for himself, like uh, uh, Bayard said he had to do. But he, he had to teach it by example, not by concept, uh, per se. It was a combination of the two. Yeah. And Hosea and others were all in that parade of, parade of uh, prophets and social change agents that made it happen. Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, you, you know, we can go down the list. Thank you. Jerry, we need you badly in CAS. You bring a very different perspective. And I will enjoy over the coming years discussing with you a number of your beliefs and a number of alternatives beliefs we got well, thank you I, i'm i'm proud to be a member of cast and I, I do attend the meetings but i i might be my picture may not be up but I, my name is there <laughs> i'm we're glad to have you thank you and in conclusion to this meeting i i have to mention that we have ernest cohorn today president emeritus yes he's waving to us uh, he's been through a rough patch and I'm not going to go into details, but he's come through the rough patch and I'm pleased to see that he is with us today. And that's a great sign for him and for us. I have the sad notice to inform you that uh, Jeffrey Sammons has passed away. He was a longtime member and devoted member of CAS. His wife, Krista, has thanked us for our concern and our expression of sympathy. And I hope uh, she will join us in the future. Our next two meetings will be devoted to roots. And that's an old name that many of us will remember. But we are going to talk about roots in the month of April and in the month of May. So please come back and join us. We look forward to being with you all. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Reverend Lestrade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you.